So I want to talk about something that lots of people like to talk about, which is entropy. And people like to talk about it because, well, it's interesting. And it does have some philosophical implications and informs our understanding of the universe in some pretty interesting ways. But I want to talk about it from a more or less practical point of view, because understanding entropy helps to understand thermodynamics. And understanding thermodynamics is essential if you want to understand, well, tons of things that we use in the modern world, especially things like engines and transistors. And those are some of my favorite things. Transistors, because I'm a condensed matter physicist and I love semiconductor physics. And if you want to understand condensed matter physics or semiconductor physics, you need to understand thermodynamics. And also because I love airplanes and rockets, and if you want to understand the engines used by those, vehicles, you need to understand thermodynamics. So I want to explain entropy in this video and some more thermodynamic concepts in the future with sort of an eye towards understanding practical applications. And also in the future, I'll probably do some explanations about engines and heat pumps and how they use thermodynamics. So thermodynamics is premised on an idea called equilibrium or thermal equilibrium. And there's actually something called the zeroth law of thermodynamics, which there's three law three other laws of thermodynamics so i guess there used to be three and then they realized that there was this zeroth law that uh, is sort of an assumption that underpins the other three and they didn't want to renumber them and make the old first law the second law and so on and so forth so they just said this is the zeroth law plus it's just sort of a assumption that underpins the others and all it says is that the idea of temperature and thermal equilibrium makes sense in the first place which they only sort of do, to be honest. But what the zeroth law says is that any two systems in thermal equilibrium with a third system will be in equilibrium with each other, right? So if I take this bottle of water, which has been out for quite a while and has reached room temperature, and this cup of tea, which has been out for a while and reached room temperature, they have both come to equilibrium with the air in the room. So now if I bring them together so that they're in thermal contact, now they're not going to exchange any heat between one another because they're already in thermal equilibrium with each other by merit of having reached thermal equilibrium with the air in the room. And things are in thermal equilibrium if when you create a passageway for heat, thermal energy to flow between them, none does, right? Which is basically to say that they're at the same temperature. So the thing that the idea of temperature and equal thermal equilibrium makes sense in the first place is the zero flaw of thermodynamics. And again, it's kind of a lie. And this is maybe why not very many people like thermodynamics, except people that tend to be very miserable, like me, who for whatever reason end up obsessed with it. But even though physicists, chemists, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, all sorts of technical disciplines really rely on the laws of thermodynamics. There seem to be fairly few people who are, like like thermodynamics, and maybe it's because it's this weird set of approximations that for whatever reason just work, which, you know, it often turns out that what we previously thought were intrinsic laws of physics turn out to be approximations, like when we went from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, we said, oh yeah, okay, classical mechanics is just an approximation of quantum mechanics. But thermodynamics, you just know from the outset is an approximation, but it just works. Um, so I don't know, I, I find that kind of interesting. But I think that's maybe part of why people don't like it very much, especially my uh, fellow physicists, even my fellow condensed matter physicists, which is weird because we use it so much. But anyways, once you 
sort of believe the zeroth law, which is a generally a reasonable statement, even if equilibrium is kind of a lie, because you can have things that seem like they're in equilibrium, but they're not, right? Uh, and again, it's whether or not heat energy ex is being exchanged, right? Because I guess you can have things that are what we call steady state, but not equilibrium, right? Like this lighter, right? If I, you know, light it, and, you know, there's a continuous supply of butane coming out from the reservoir that keeps the flame going. And so it's steady state, it's not changing in time, but it's not actually an equilibrium, right? It's constantly exchanging heat with the environment. The flame is much hotter than the air around it. In fact, so much hotter you really shouldn't touch it for too long. But it's not changing in temperature, right? It's continually being replenished by the heat of combustion from the butane inside. And so it's in steady state, but not in equilibrium. And conversely, you can have things that are in equilibrium, at least temporarily, but not in steady state. We call them quasi-static processes, where things are changing in a sort of smooth way, where they're not steady state at all. They're cha very much changing in time, but each point in time is sort of a, its own little local equilibrium. So if we accept all that, what are the actual three laws of thermodynamics besides that zeroth one that's kind of a lie because well, what can I say? It's all made up, which doesn't bother, again, doesn't bother me as much, because uh, as a condensed matter physicist, to me, all theories are effective theories, and it's not that big a deal. <laughs> but uh, there's three laws of thermodynamics, right? The first one just says that energy is conserved, right? we say that the change in internal energy, which is just the energy inside a system, that's exactly what it sounds like, is equal to the heat transfer, which can be positive or negative. Heat, you know, positive heat transfer is if heat energy goes into the system, if you bring it in contact with something that's hotter, or it can be negative if you bring it in contact with something that's colder and it loses thermal energy, minus the work done by the system. So if a volume of gas or of anything for that matter expands it does work right work is mechanical energy is a form of energy and that work has to come from somewhere and it comes from the internal energy of the system and so for purposes of thermodynamics there is only two ways that energy can enter or exit a system or I should say for the purposes of thermodynamics as we're going to understand it there's only two ways that energy can enter or exit a system which are heat transfer and work sometimes there might be other ways but you can usually just model them as heat transfer with some extra steps and sort of shuffle the rest under the rug so that one's fairly straightforward it's just that we say that internal energy is heat transfer minus work and, you know, ignore any other forms of heat, uh, any other forms of energy transfer and just model them as some form of heat transfer. And also, this is all honky dory with chemical reactions because internal energy includes the difference in uh, energy between the reactants and the products of a chemical reaction. So they might change the temperature, but they don't change the internal energy. So there's just heat transfer of work. That's all we have to worry about. Let's We won't uh, get sucked down the rabbit hole of worrying about directly coupling to electromagnetic fields. And if we have radio waves or light passing through something, we'll just model that as uh, heating that happens through the volume instead of the surface. And we'll just, so we'll just model that as heat transfer. Okay, so then what about the sort of infamous second law of thermodynamics, which is what we're going to spend most of our time now talking about. Well, the second law of thermodynamics says that the change in entropy, notice that this is uh, this is not an equation, it's an inequality. It says that the change in entropy must be greater than or equal to the heat transfer divided by the temperature. And so people will frequently say that this implies that entropy can only go up, and that is mostly true. In fact, it appears to be true. I, again, I don't want to comment on whether or not the heat death of the universe will happen. Uh, I don't think it's clear that it will happen. I don't think it's clear that it won't happen. Um, 
But the second law of thermodynamics, you'll notice that uh, I've told you Q can be negative, right? If a system loses thermal energy, then it will actually lose entropy too, or it can lose entropy, I should say. But given that energy in the universe as a whole is conserved, it would certainly seem that as you shuffle energy from one place to another, you're not going to have total entropy go down. But again, it's complicated, and I, as a sort of staunch empiricist, don't believe that uh, there is these sort of platonic ideals that, uh, you know, we sit down and, you know, discover purely by thinking about them. And historically, we did not discover these things by sitting down and thinking about them. And I actually almost had to debate in my head which order to explain these things in, because I thought about starting with talking about atoms and molecules, but we don't see atoms and molecules, right? We see their effects, and we see things like if you take a hot thing and a cold thing, and you put them next to each other, the hot thing gets colder and the cold thing gets hotter, <laughs> right? Until they're the same temperature, which those already are, but they were different temperatures uh, a little while ago. Or, you know, like this. This is hotter, right? When I, when I uh, start burning the butane in, in here, right, the air does not get colder, right? The air gets warmer. So we want uh, models that reflect our experiences in the universe and the experiments we can conduct. So the second law of thermodynamics is a way of modeling the thing that we observe, which is that heat only ever goes from hot to cold unless you have some other convoluted thing to make it go from cold to hot. And it turns out the reason to study things like thermodynamics is if you're clever, you can make heat flow from cold to hot, but only indirectly, right? And again, in the future, we'll get into detail how heat pumps, aka air conditioners and refrigerators work. But because this is an inequality, it's not a guarantee that entropy will go up by exactly heat transfer divided by temperature. It means that it will go up by at least that amount. So it could very well go up by more than that, right? And that would satisfy the second law just fine, right? And so the total heat transfer through a system is going to be zero if there's nothing else, right? So if I consider a combined system of, you know, if this cup of tea were still warm and this water bottle were still cold and I brought them together, right? And there were, you know, not any heat transfer to the air in the room. See, I'm having to make a lot of assumptions, al assumptions already, but it all works, right? The total heat transfer would be zero, right? Because I would just be moving it from the tea to the water bottle without moving any heat from to or from the surrounding environment. But the entropy would go up. And it would go up because the temperature of the tea is hotter. So the the Q for the tea the Q for the cup of tea, <laughs> a poor choice of beverage there, I suppose. The Q for the cup of tea would be negative. Or, oh, here, since it's not warm anyways, let's use my empty coffee cup from this morning. The the Q from the cup up of coffee to the water bottle would be negative, right? Or the, the, Q, for, the, the Q for the cup of coffee would be negative, right? It would lose heat, and that means it would, or at least could, decrease its entropy, but the water bottle that's receiving positive heat transfer will necessarily gain entropy. And so that kind of brings me to understanding what temperature quote unquote really is, because again, temperature is something we discovered by just experiencing the world and we can feel these things cold and hot. And then we came up with, you know, more systematic ways to measure cold and hot because, you know, temperature has certain consistent consistent effects on different things, and thermometers, in some sense, only ever measure the temperature of themselves. But um, you kind of have to ask the question then, well, what is temperature? Because I've told you that 
heat transfer is just the motion, the transfer of thermal energy, right? And it's like, well, isn't that what temperature is? It's just thermal energy. It's like, well, not quite, right? Uh, and in fact, Q isn't thermal energy. It's thermal energy transfer. So then it's like, oh, so then one is the transfer and one is the amount. No, it's all that's also not it. Um, it's 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 a definition that might almost seem circular when you look at this, but what temperature really is, is it's a measure of how much energy does it take to increase the entropy by a given amount, right? And that makes sense relative to this definition, right? Is that we want to say that, you know, there's this thing entropy and it increases by an amount equal to the heat transfer into a system divided by the temperature, right? So if something has a high temperature, that means it takes a lot of energy to increase the entropy, then that would satisfy this inequality as an, as an equality, as long as entropy is greater than that amount. Versus if something is very cold, then it only takes a small amount of heat transfer to increase the entropy by the same amount, or the same amount of heat transfer will increase the entropy by more. So the sort of like real quote unquote definition of temperature is not just the average velocity of atoms and molecules or something like that. It's the it's the partial derivative of energy with respect to entropy. It's how which is, you know, the ch or if you don't know partial derivatives in calculus, it's the change in energy delta e or delta u. Uh, we didn't want to get confused, I guess, so we write, uh, instead of writing, I, uh, they, they didn't want to argue about whether E would be entropy or energy, so I guess they used U for internal energy and S for uh, entropy. So the quantity delta U over delta S, you know, the change in energy divided by the change in entropy is at least in some sense what the temperature like really quote unquote is now that does correspond to the average velocity of the atoms and molecules all bouncing around the only thing to bear in mind is that the average energy per atom or per molecule is not exactly equal to the temperature per se but there is a guarantee for most systems that any time you add energy, you will get more entropy, never less. But you're not guaranteed to always get the same amount more. And that's what the temperature really is. It's you will always get more entropy if you add more energy to a system, but exactly how much more. So then you might wonder, well, what happens if that's not the case? <laughs> and the answer is, don't worry about it. <laughs> but you kind of have to, because uh, lasers break everything. Um, I'm, I'm being a little bit facetious when I say that. Um, but, uh, you know, a laser is something that's very definitely steady state, right? As long as I'm holding the button down, it's not changing in time. It's putting out constant optical power. But there's a very real sense in which a laser actually does have a situation where if you add energy, the entropy goes down. But we can weasel our way out of that by saying lasers aren't really in equilibrium, um, and in fact, technically, if you try to calculate the temperature of something like a laser, you will get a negative number, right? In not just like, you know, below freezing on some arbitrary scale, below absolute zero. And it's not that it's actually below absolute zero. It's that it's lasers and things like lasers are inherently non-equilibrium phenomena and one of the hardest classes I ever took in my physics PhD was non-equilibrium thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And I rec I do recommend it because it's really interesting, but it was rather challenging. So speaking of absolute zero, though, 
I'm going to talk real quick about the third law of thermodynamics, which says that as entropy approaches or sorry, as the temperature approaches absolute zero, entropy approaches a constant. And that's important for a few reasons. It's one of the reasons you can never reach absolute zero. But what, the, the simplest reason to understand why you can't reach absolute zero is in terms of what I just told you, that the temperature is a measure of how much entropy you get per unit energy. Or sorry, yeah, it's, it's a measure of how much energy it takes to increase the entropy by a given amount. See, so we, we, we frequently end up talking about a quantity beta, which is 1 over temperature, because that it usually ends up being sort of the algebra is just easier to work with. But I need to keep it keep it straight in my head. So, But that means that as you approach absolute zero, right, if temperature is measuring how much energy it takes to increase the entropy, and you're saying the amount it takes is none, zero, that implies that any amount of energy at all will increase the entropy, or any finite amount of energy would increase the entropy infinitely, <laughs> right? So you can't ever really get there because you reach a situation where you have to remove energy from something that just gets sort of infinite utility out of just the tiniest amount of energy. And so it just really doesn't want to give that energy up. And the fact that entropy approaches a constant as temperature approaches absolute zero implies some things about the heat capacity of things approaching absolute zero, which sort of explains why you can't get there. And the sort of simplified explanation is because that would be the point at which, you know, atoms and molecules completely stop moving. Um, and that is, again, also more or less true, but it's a little more complicated than that. So moving on, though, I've told you now all these things about entropy, but I haven't actually told you, like, what it is. <laughs> Right, because people, I, I've told you how to calculate the minimum increase, and I've hopefully given you a little bit of a of a sense of, you know, what entropy is from looking at the flow of heat. Because again, it was invented to understand the flow of heat and to understand the efficiency of engines, not as a measure of disorder. But now I want to explain why people say it's a measure of disorder and connect that back to the actual macroscopic definition. So. The reason people say it's a measure of disorder is because eventually people discovered that entropy can be expressed this way. It's S, again, S for entropy, because I guess we didn't want to argue about whether E would be entropy or energy, so it get, neither gets to be E. So S for entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant, Kb, which is just the ideal gas constant divided by Avogadro's number, and it's just so you can have the units of temperature and energy that you want. And if you work in units of temperature that are equal to units of energy, it's just equal to one. Um, don't do that, though. That is like measuring, you know, measuring the size of your house in nanometers. It's possible, but extremely inconvenient, <laughs> right? So the reason, you know, I but this is just something I like to point out is that technically units of temper temperature are not fundamental. They're just kind of arbitrary. But it's, it's kind of like how we typically don't measure angles in radians when we're doing geometry. We use degrees because they're, and it's maybe befitting that they're also named degrees because it's just way, 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 way more convenient. So just know that the Boltzmann constant is just so that we can use units of temperature that aren't like weird and like obnoxious, right? Because if you want to express room temperature in terms of joules, it's like, I mean, yeah, it ends up being like 10 to the minus 25 or something ridiculous like that. I, I don't even rem remember. Um, so yeah, just, you know, it's just, but it's just so we can get good units. But then uh, look at this other part, which is the natural logarithm of W. And maybe W is unfortunate because W also stands for work, but this, that is not work. That remember, work doesn't change the entropy. It can change the temperature and it can change the energy, but work does not inherently change the entropy the way that heat transfer does. But that W is the what we call 
microstates per macrostate, right? So a microstate is the specific way that the atoms and molecules are arranged inside of something, or just the particles, or just the internal state of something in general is arranged. And the macrostate is the sort of external configuration. It's the things we actually measure at a macroscopic scale, like pressure and temperature, volume, density, all those you know, handy dandy thermodynamic variables. And entropy is really a measure of how many microstates there are per macrostate. Um, and so then you might wonder why is it the log of that number instead of just that number? And that's because we want entropy to be what's called an extensive quantity, which is to say we want it to be linear in the size of the system. Because any well-behaved, what we call state variable. Um, so, you know, a state variable is something that only depends on the current state, right? As opposed to things like heat transfer and work depends on what has happened, you know, what happened in the past to get you to that state. Uh, state variable, it doesn't matter what happened. All that matters is the current state. For things to be a well-defined state variable, they need to be either what we call extensive, which is where they scale linearly with the size of the system, or intensive, where they're independent, totally independent of the size of the system, right? So uh, an extensive variable is like mass, right? So if you have, you know, say, you know, some a cubic meter of air at one atmosphere at room temperature, and that weighs a certain amount. Well, if you have two cubic meters, it should weigh twice as much, right? So that's an extensive variable versus an intensive variable would be density, right? So if you have one cubic meter, you know, of a gas at a te particular temperature and pressure, that should have the same density as two cubic meters at the same density, at the same temperature and pressure, right? Because the mass is extensive. And when you divide the mass by the volume, you should just get a constant, which is intensive. But W is neither extensive nor intensive. It's exponential in the size of the system, right? And the way we usually explain that is with something like a, a deck of cards, right? If I take, you know, half a deck of cards, say, you know, 26 out of the 52, uh, there's a certain number of ways I can rearrange them, right? And shuffle them around to get, you know, a new order. And there's, in fact, 26 factorial, which is a very big number of ways to arrange 26 cards. Well, if I put the whole deck back together, and get 52 cards, there's a lot more than 26 factorial, there's 52 factorial, and 52 factorial is a lot bigger than 26 factorial, right? When you double the size of the deck, you create much more than double the number of possible orderings of the cards, right? You know, like, if you have two cards, there's only two possible orders, this one's first or this one's first. When you have three cards, there's six possible orders, and I'm not going to go through them all, right? And then when you have four cards, there's 24 possible orders, and so on and so forth, right? It's it's not linear. It's approximately exponential. Uh, and in the, in, the, in the limit of an infinitely large system, which we're always taking the so-called thermodynamic limit, where we consider the system to be very large, and again, it's dubious if such a thing really exists or not, but we get the right answer by assuming that it does, so uh, pay no attention to the assumptions behind the curtain. But if we want to get rid of that exponential, we have to take the natural logarithm. And remember, the logarithm of an exponential is just the thing inside the exponential. So the log gets rid of the exponent for us, and we're left with something that is linear in the size of the system. So it's extensive. And then we can divide that by the number of particles in the system to get the entropy per unit, the entropy per particle, or usually you actually want the entropy per mole, right? Because you typically your macroscopic scales are dealing with order Avogadro's number of atoms, six times 10 to the 23rd, if you don't know, uh, because that's how many carbon atoms it takes to make up eight grams or how many hydrogen atoms it takes to make one gram approximately. We well, guess it's exactly how many carbon atoms it takes to make uh, eight grams uh, or 12. I should know. I should know the atomic mass of carbon. It's twelve, isn't it? I I better not be wrong about that. <laughs> um, so once you have an extensive quantity like that, you can make whatever intensive quantity you'd like by defining by d dividing by another extensive quantity or by dividing by whatever relevant size of the system. Uh, usually, you want the entropy per mole, or you might want the entropy per kilogram or per volume or just whatever you want. 
But as long as it's extensive, you can make an intensive quantity. But if it's exponential, then no dice, it doesn't work. So one final aside that I'll mention just because I'm probably going to reference it in the future. And it's that uh, if you can write down this equation this way, uh, one of the cool things about that is you can invert that, and the flip side is you can then calculate the number of microstates per macrostate, which normally is not that useful at like for like large systems. But when you're trying to calculate what sort of pieces inside the system are doing, it's useful because you can calculate the probability of a sort of a small deviation from equilibrium inside the system. And if you've ever seen the, the rate equation in chemistry uh, and wondered why wh where that e to the minus activation energy comes from, it, it comes from this. And uh, this is very, very useful in condensed matter physics for calculating things like the probability of an electron jumping over an energy barrier, uh, not due to quantum tunneling, just due to, you know, random fluctuations due to temperature giving the electron enough energy to overcome some energy barrier. Because uh, again, temperature is not the energy in every single atom or molecule, and it's not even the average, but at any finite temperature, the atoms and molecules will ha all have random energies, and there's some probability of them having an energy larger than the activation energy or larger than an energy barrier, and you can calculate that probability, which is actually very, very, very useful. <laughs> um, so I thought I would mention that uh, in no small part because I recently heard somebody that I, I don't want to say I felt scooped by, but uh, because uh, YouTube doesn't work like academic publishing. Um, but... Uh, yeah, they, I, 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 I couldn't, I couldn't get uh, through them saying that that wasn't important because, uh, I, I, again, I don't know how philosophically important it is, but it is darn useful. I can tell you that. <laughs> so, uh, the ability to calculate the probability of a component of your system uh, going above some energy is a uh, lets you just calculate lots of very useful things. And so for that matter, do the other three law the, the three laws of thermodynamics, right? Because uh, this is not a law of thermodynamics, but this is something that goes hand in hand with the laws of thermodynamics. And this explains why people will frequently say that entropy, you know, disorder is always going up in the universe, right? Is because if if entropy as defined by this thing about heat transfer is always going up, and entropy in turn is equal to the number of microstates per macrostate, or the logarithm the number of microstates per macrostate. Uh, that implies that the universe is tending towards the most chaotic possibility that it can. And I guess that's sort of true. I would more so say that if you assume the universe is chaotic, it will just tend towards the sort of versions of itself that have the most internal possibilities. Um, which is an almost sort of a tautological statement, right? And uh, I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't worry about the heat death of the universe, not the least of which because we'll all be dead long before that happens, but uh, it's not even clear that uh, it will happen. Again, not clear it won't happen, but uh, be careful of extrapolating infinitely far into the future. <laughs> so anyways, we'll get into how to understand engine engine and heat pump cycles next time, and then into different aspects of thermodynamics in the future. And uh, to think this, all, this actually all started because I wanted to explain some features of ramjets, and I kind of went down the recursive rabbit hole, so now we're doing this entropy video. But uh, anyways, hopefully you found that informative. Uh, do stay tuned in the future, and uh, yeah, look uh, look for that... Uh, that, that uh, engine cycle and then that ramjet video in the future. I guess uh, hopefully you found this informative in, it, in itself, though. Great. Right. Bye.